Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Tim Schaefer with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. I'd like to welcome everyone to this meeting of the agency's Habitat and Environmental Committee. Uh, this meeting is being broadcast on Facebook Live in real time. A recording of the meeting will be immediately available on our Facebook page after the meeting ends, and a recording will also be posted to the Commission's YouTube page within a few days. With that, I'll turn it over to Committee Chair Don Anderson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for our Habitat and Environmental Committee meeting today. Uh, today we have four presentations from our staff uh, that we'll have some discussion on. Uh, I'm looking forward to all four of these presentations. Uh, I'm always impressed with the uh, work that our staff and Habitat and Environmental do for our agency, so I'm sure that uh, they're not going to disappoint us today with uh, their presentations. Uh, at this time, I'd like uh, Yvonne Greer to take a roll call of the committee members that are present today. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Committee Chair Don Anderson. Present. Committee Vice Chair Eric Hassar. Here. Commissioner Dan Pastori. Present. Commissioner B.J. Small. Present. All members of the committee are present. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, at this time, I'd uh, like to know if we have any public comments. So I'll ask our Chief Counsel, Wayne Melnick, if uh, he has anything uh, to report to us on public comment. Uh, Chairman Anderson, we've received no public comment for this meeting. Okay, thank you, Wayne. Okay, uh, we will begin our uh, uh, meeting here today with our first presentation, and I believe Ben Lorson is going to give that. So, uh, Ben, I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson, and good morning to the other commissioners, as well as members of the public that may be listening in to the Habitat and Environmental Committee meeting this morning. Today for a discussion item, I will be providing a presentation on road salt impact and the overall salinization of our freshwater systems. Next slide, please. You might be wondering why we're talking about road salt today, um, but we've all seen the news articles that come out about road salt application and impact to our aquatic resources. Most of these articles are generated uh, when new peer reviewed literature is published. Um, and we certainly get inquiries from commissioners as well as many others. Um, so we ended up putting together a presentation today to describe the overall uh, road salt use in Pennsylvania. When folks think about road salt, they immediately jump to PennDOT. So we talked with folks in PennDOT's winter maintenance program. And I think as you'll learn today, um, they go to great lengths to, to uh, improve the efficiency of their road salt application. Um, we also want to introduce the overall topic of freshwater salinization, um, not just in Pennsylvania, but across the country. Uh, we see increasing salinization trends, not just where road salt is applied, but in other um, areas where uh, we don't apply road salt for winter maintenance programs. I want to touch on some of the current research uh, pointing to aquatic resource impact and then end the presentation with um, some thoughts on what can be done to stabilize or reverse these increasing salinization trends. Next slide. So what is a salt? Uh, most people think of a salt, they think of table salt, which is simple sodium, uh, simply sodium chloride. Um, however, salt is a much broader group of chemical co compounds made up of a positively charged and a negatively charged ion. I have many um, common anions and cations listed, as well as common salts. And the importance of salts when we're talking about our freshwater systems is that salts easily go into solution where they break down into their ionic components. And when those flow off into our freshwater systems, we end up with these ionic soups that can lead to, to freshwater salinization. There is natural um, ions in our waters in Pennsylvania that's made primarily due to the underlying geology. Um, those uh, ions are dominated by calcium and bicarbonate ions. 
Um, but today we're here to really talk about the uh, human additions of ions to our freshwater systems. Next slide, please. So road salt, um, quite simply, is uh, another term uh, that we think of as de-icers um, or rock salt. Um, rock salt is the most common form of road salt that's used uh, specifically in Pennsylvania, sodium chloride, which is the same um, salt as table salt. Um, there are alternatives out there, um, primarily potassium, calcium, and magnesium chloride. However, there are various reasons they aren't used on a wider scale, um, some of that uh, being cost. Um, the, those that are readily available, sodium chloride is just uh, more readily available. And there are, are also other consequences of these other salts, um, one of them being corrosiveness. So the more you use these other alternatives, the, the shorter uh, our roads will last. Um, the primary use of road salt is to be used as a de-icer for public safety reasons, uh, to keep our roadway safe in the wintertime um, for all of the travel that occurs. Um, road salt is used not just by state highway departments. Um, there's also a large proportion of use by municipal roadway departments, as well as private road and parking lot owners. Um, when looking at a uh, few of the Northeast states, a uh, study that was conducted found that in reality, only 9% of the road salt that is used in the states that were looked at was applied by the state highway departments um, like PennDOT. 50% um, of the road salt used was being applied to, to parking lots um, and other commercial surfaces. Um, we all can think uh, of uh, looking at gas station and grocery store parking lots and the heavy application of salt in those areas. And the other thing to, to point out um, is that 75% of commercial snow removal do not track um, their salt application rate. Um, they kind of eyeball it and use what they think is going to be sufficient to keep them from having to come back and apply again. It is important to point out that there is an incentive for efficient use of our road salt, not just from an environmental perspective and keeping those salts from running off into our waterways, but also there is a cost savings. Um, you, you use less salt, that means more money in your pocket at the end of the day. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we spoke with uh, the chief of PennDOT's winter maintenance program just to learn about um, how they go about doing their business. And it, it was, uh, in my opinion, um, impressive the lengths that they go to to try and um, keep the roads safe as well as limit the, the application of their salt. And it's not just uh, public safety and budgetary reasons. They also do acknowledge the environmental, um, potential environmental impacts of using too much salt. So PennDOT treats about 40,000 miles of roadways in Pennsylvania. Um, to do this, they use uh, close to 2,400 pieces of equipment and just shy of 5,000 workers. Um, over the last five years, on average, they've used uh, close to 850,000 tons of salt per year, and they use some of that to make brine. Last year, they used eight, over 8 million gallons of salt brine to pretreat roads um, prior to storms. Um, as I mentioned, when folks think of road salt, um, it's easy to jump to PennDOT, but there is a comparable mileage of uh, municipal roads treated by the municipal departments. And um, with the previous slide, you saw that there's a large contribution to private uh, parking lots, sidewalks, and driveways. Um, PennDOT guides their uh, application of salt based on real-time tracking of storms. Um, so they use things like the precipitation type, the air and road temperatures, the timing of the storm in relation to heavy travel times to determine when to treat and what type of treatment to use. Um, last year, over $250 million was spent to keep our roadways safe in the wintertime by PennDOT. And of that total, about $50 million was used um, to buy road salt. Next slide, please. Um, PennDOT also uh, tracks their salt use. They have a targeted application rate of 500 pounds per lane mile, and they are working on outfitting their trucks. They're not all um, outfitted yet, but they're working on getting all trucks outfitted with real-time tracking so they can actually, a supervisor or manager can 
could actually call up an operator and ask him to, to slow down or speed up the application of road salt. Um, they also do a, a pretty in-depth annual training program for their operators, highlighting um, how to maximize the application of, of road salt on our roadways. And they use things such as uh, an example showing that uh, differing amounts of salt do not always equate to more melting. So they use one example where they use three times the amount of salt on the same amount of ice and show at the end of the, the example that the same amount of water is melted at the end of the, the same time period. PennDOT also uses salt brine. <clears throat> this is a 23% sodium chloride solution, which jump starts the melting process when they pre-apply to roadways. Um, and they've also found through studies that it reduces scatter. Um, with raw rock salt, they lose about 12% to the roadway shoulders, where if they treat with a salt brine, it rounds down the edges and reduce the scatter and they only lose about 4% to the roadway shoulders. So with that 8% reduction, um, that can mean millions of dollars in PennDOT's budget. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, uh, um, PennDOT's going to, to lengths to um, maximize their efficiency of road salt use. Um, there's plenty of other road salt used by municipal and, and private entities. Um, but this is not the only um, input of salt to our freshwater systems. We also know that uh, fertilizers are salt that can run off of our agricultural operations and into our wa waterways. We have sewage and industrial effluents where it's difficult to treat for inorganic salts, so they uh, pass through our systems. Um, we have Marcellus waste um, that some are used for dust suppressant. Um, and can run off into our waterways, as well as the weathering of concrete surfaces, which is most pronounced in our urban settings. And with all of this combined, you know, we're seeing in our freshwater systems um, this trend of increasing ionic concentrations in those systems. And as I mentioned, it's not just in the areas that have to deal with winter maintenance, it's, it's other areas of the country as well. And we're seeing the same trends in Pennsylvania. Next slide. Looking at um, some of the current research that's out there, uh, Hintz and Relia in 2019 did a comprehensive literature review of road salt impacts at species, community, and ecosystem levels. They looked at um, increasing concentrations of salinization and, and how it impacts um, those different uh, the, the, at the species, community, and ecosystem levels. Um, and what they found is that there's an increasing amount of study into this issue. And over the last 10 years, there's been about uh, 70 pieces of peer-reviewed literature um, that have been published. Jackson and Funk with the Stroud Water Research Center in 2019 published a mayfly toxicity study looking at uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland streams. They also did some previous research um, helping to inform the development of chloride criteria in Pennsylvania. And what they found, just like many other species groups, there's varying uh, sensitivities and tolerances um, to salinity. Um, some mayflies uh, start to become impacted at a couple hundred milligrams per liter. Other ones are several thousand milligrams per liter. But the reality of what they found is that even the most tolerant species were seeing uh, concentrations in the environment that greatly exceed those most tolerant species. In Southeast PA, they have seen uh, documented salinity levels greater than 11,000 milligrams per liter in the wintertime. In Maryland, Stranko and others uh, in 2013 looked at some of their Maryland biological stream surveys and water quality data uh, to make some interesting notes. Um, just like many other uh, studies, as salinity increases, um, you start to lose the most sensitive species, so your diversity decreases with increasing chloride concentrations. And they noted this in uh, fish, mayflies, uh, salamanders, and mussels. They also noted that no brook trout were found in streams with chloride greater than 280 milligrams per liter, um, and the highest density brook trout populations were at chloride concentrations less than 100 milligrams per liter. Next slide. We also look at um, toxicity testing of uh, species groups, as I mentioned, uh, mayfly toxicity testing. Uh, we look at you know, what an organism can withstand for a short period of time, 
uh, around an hour, as well as what they can withstand for a several day period, um, which would be more looking at what they can tolerate at background levels. Um, we know with some of this toxicity testing that muscles are some of the most sensitive, um, starting out with just over 100 milligrams per liter, um, believing to uh, be the point where muscle, some muscle species tend to be impacted. Um, it was noted in the, the Maryland study mentioned in the previous slide that muscles were not found in streams with chloride concentrations greater than 85 milligrams per liter. And based on some of this toxicity testing, you know, you can look specifically at a specific ion or a specific contaminant, but it's important to point out that the, this toxicity can vary based on the presence of other ions, uh, other contaminants, and different water quality conditions like changing temperatures. Um, we know that chloride uh, and increasing salinities impact the osmoregulatory function, specifically in fishes, and uh, this is their ability to maintain a steady ion concentration within their bodies in relation to the surrounding environment. So it's fairly easy to understand how uh, changing ion concentrations in the environment would impact the fish's ability to maintain a steady ion concentration within their body. Um, some of this research, uh, we know that uh, increased uh, salinities can be more detrimental to early life stages, something that's toxic to eggs and fry may not impact an adult um, organism. And there are also uh, noted sublethal effects. Um, increased salinity concentrations can suppress uh, feeding and growth that have indirect impacts. Next slide. So getting down to what can be done, um, some thoughts. Uh, we know that current literature indicates that our freshwater systems are increasing in salinization. This is noted not just in our country's waters, but within PA as well uh, with some analysis that DEP has done on PA water quality network stations. Um, but I think we also need to continue to learn from these water quality uh, data networks, how that's impacting our biological communities, as well as some of the other ions or contaminants that could be um, impacting in addition to uh, salinity. We do not have water quality criteria in Pennsylvania to protect aquatic life use. Um, we do have chloride criteria uh, for potable water supply at 250 milligrams per liter. Um, so one step could be to develop meaningful water quality criteria to protect aquatic life use. Um, this has been done in other states, and what that would do, um, establishing water quality criteria for chloride in other states, uh, they've initiated the development of total max daily loads, or TMDLs, for chlorides. Um, when we looked at these in other states, uh, the TMDLs tend to recommend best management practices rather than specific enforceable actions. So it is a step in the right direction, but it's not a silver bullet. It would certainly shed light on the, the topic, um, but, but uh, due to the lack of enforceable actions, it, it becomes difficult to make uh, drastic changes. Next slide. Um, really, um, what I think is the, the main point is to create awareness and provide education on the overall freshwater salinization of our uh, freshwater systems. Um, this awareness and education can lead to uh, behavioral changes by the public, which is what I think needs to happen um, specifically to reduce the, the amount of salt that's spread in the wintertime. And we also need to think long-term here. Um, this is not an issue that has popped up overnight, and it certainly isn't an issue that can be fixed overnight. So we, we need to be looking what we can do now to affect change down the road. Next slide. In summary, we know that freshwater salinization trends are increasing. Um, we know that that has impacts on our aquatic resources, um, specifically um, impacting the most sensitive species. We know that salt comes from many sources. It's not just the application of road salt in the wintertime. Um, and we know that it's not just PennDOT, and that PennDOT is a small um, con contributor when you look at all of the municipal and private um, road salt applications that, that's occurring. And PennDOT is taking steps to um, maximize efficiency of their road salt use. Um, and last, um, reversing these salinization trends 
um, will take long-term behavioral changes. Um, I should say stabilizing or reversing salinization trends will take long-term behavioral changes. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Hi, Ben. This is B Commissioner B.J. Small. Th first of all, thanks for this great report. Um, I work for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. We're certainly concerned about the use of road salt and have been tracking it. I think it's a real shame we do not have water quality criteria for aquatic life. Uh, first of all, and that's, that's just a statement. Uh, we know about some of the issues and, you know, and PennDOT's abilities, but the fact that so much of this use is private and in, in uh, parking, parking lots and so on is really something to be aware of. It seems to me the use on rural roads in a lot of cases are an opportunity for some dilution where, you know, the impervious surface and parking lots and so on is directly into the stormwater and directly, you know, goes directly to the, uh, uh, to local rivers and streams. I don't know, we, we're look, the state's trying to rec regulate the use of fertilizer. I don't know whether there would be an opportunity or even if it's feasible to look at trying to do that with uh, the use of salt privately. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I would put this in the same category as being able to regulate fertilizer use. It, it's certainly, we can talk with PennDOT and, and have them meet certain application rates, but how do we reach all of the private um, snow removal companies that are applying road salt on uh, all of these private parking lots? And, and I think with fertilizer, when you, when you get down to um, trying to um, regulate all of the, the private homeowners that are applying fertilizer on their lawns or paying someone to apply that, you know, I, I think it, it becomes uh, more difficult when it's not just one central user of that um, product. Right. I, yeah, I agree. And, and the state's having difficulty with the fertilizer bill in itself. And one, one last thing, and just something for us to be uh, aware of, and we probably are, is the projected use of oil and gas wastewater on, on dusty roads. Um, I think this could get yep. to be present a similar, a similar problem down the road. <laughs> Pun intended. Agreed. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. And Commissioner Don Anderson here. I, I just have a question for you. Uh, having raised trout for quite some time, uh, you know, it's been common practice uh, with uh, trout hatcheries and that to use trout as a therapeutic treatment uh, at times for external bacteria and parasites. Uh, and of course, we have a table to follow with, you know, the certain amount of poundage to use uh, per gallon flow of water to get, you know, whatever desired percent concentration. Uh, and of course, I think we use up to about a 3% solution at times. Uh, uh, I, I guess I wasn't, uh, you know, aware that there would be some, you know, bad impacts here from salt use on our waterways. Uh, I, I saw your amounts listed there you had in your charts, but can you give me any kind of idea what percent of solution becomes harmful to, to some aquatic uh, uh, organisms or to fish? Uh, I guess I'm asking you to translate into something I'm a little bit more familiar with, uh, you know, and what I do with fish culture. Yeah, I, I can offer some general comments. I don't know that I can specifically answer your question, um, but I can do some digging and get you a, a more complete answer. But, you know, I'm sure that those salt solutions that are being applied uh, for treatment in a, a hatchery setting are at a level that would not be, um, has already been determined not to be detrimental to those particular fishes. Um, I, in salmon is in particular are a little more tolerant uh, when we think of some of them actually being able to um, be uh, uh, anadromous forms where they travel back and forth between salt and fresh water. Um, but, you know, when that wash, and it's also in a hatchery setting going to be short term because treated and then, you know, for a short period uh, that 
fish tend to have a much higher tolerance for a short period than a long period. Um, but what that's doing to downstream um, waters, I, I don't know if it's being used in a, a, a high enough concentration to impact uh, critters in the downstream waters or not. Um, so, yeah, usually, you know, usually, some other states that have, yeah. I was going to say some other states that have uh, water quality criteria for aquatic life use, um, some of those are around 230 milligrams per liter. Usually what we use is a one to, at the most, 2% solution. That's, that's all I have. Thank you. Yep. Does anyone else have any questions for Ben? Yeah, this is, this is uh, Commissioner Hussar. Um, ben, thanks. Uh, um, I, I guess, you know, on, Looking what you uh, looking at the presentation here is, uh, I mean, this is something that you know. First of all, I'm glad we're looking at. I, I, I it looks like when you wrote it on your discussion items, the long term impacts are something we really need to focus on strategically with our warm and cold water fisheries and protecting the aquatic life in these streams and rivers and waterways. So. Uh, um, you know, I, I think this needs to continue to be in the forefront. Um, this practice probably isn't going to change overnight, and it looks like it's going to be here with, uh, as Pennsylvania grows, this is going to continue to be a, um, 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 have an effect on the, um, the environment and the resource. So, uh, um, we need to keep this on the, the top burner and, and and looking at ways and methods and uh, uh, studies to uh, get a handle on this going forward as we have in the past. So, uh, but thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Thank you. And this is Commissioner Charlesworth. Um, in Lackawanna County, we have. Uh, a natural geologic formation that creates what we call the notch. And in the notch, Route 6, Route 11, Interstate 8, alongside of uh, Leggett's Creek, which is a tributary to the Lackawanna River, the, the area on Route 6 uh, above that, on both sides, is two miles, almost entirely paved parking lots. Uh, when we take our surveys below the in the sal uh, the salt content, and uh, is there any way that they can use uh, a different solution, or uh, I guess, do they take each roadway and and calculate the amount of salt that they're using, and do they do it individually, or do they consider all three roads going through there? To my knowledge, they do not look at roads individually, but they do have a a targeted application rate of 500 pounds per lane mile. Um, you know, certainly maybe they could look if, if it was brought to their attention uh, of the high uh, density of impervious surface and, and runoff, you know, potential runoff to the waterway there. Maybe they could look at an alternative. Um, there, there are other alternatives out there. However, none of them are, you know, commercially feasible uh, to be produced at a large scale. And some of the other uh, potassium chlorides um, magnesium chlorides, um, you know, with sodium chloride, it, chloride becomes a contaminant where if we're looking at some of the other salts, it's, it's the, uh, the cation that, that can become the contaminant. So, so there's not really an easy answer as far as an alternative, but, you know, if, if that particular situation is brought to PennDOT's attention, it, it could certainly be something that, that they would be willing to look into because they don't want to be impacting um, the environment any more than, than we would like to see. Okay, thank you. This is Mr. This is Mr. Lewis. Um, 
you spoke a little bit about alternatives to salt. Um, I seem to have either read or seen in my travels sometimes some agricultural products being used, maybe like, I'm gonna guess beet juice maybe. Do any of these other products show any promise of displacing the amount of salt that we would use? And are they as effective or not as effective as salt in ice and snow control? Yes, yeah, thanks. They have looked at alternatives. Beet juice is one of the most common ones that you hear about. Um, I know in Wisconsin, they use some byproducts from cheese, the, uh, the process of making cheese. Um, but really, that's only available on a local scale, um, and there's only so much of that product available. So really what it comes down to for some of these other alternatives is the cost and availability of them. Um, they're either uh, way too expensive or not readily available on a commercial scale, even though they can show some effectiveness at um, de-icing roadways. Okay, I appreciate that. And then also, um, if you could comment a little more, I've been reading a lot about this business of the fracking water being spread on gravel roads and the most recent article I read stated that there didn't seem to be any dust mitigation benefits of any great amount from that spreading. And uh, could, I'm not sure where we're at, not necessarily we, but I guess it's the Pennsylvania uh, EPA is at with regard to either regulating or releasing uh, that fracking water to be used on gravel roads. Uh, I can't get into the specifics on what DEP is doing from the regulatory side, but I've read many of the same articles that, that you have, I'm sure. Um, and, and what I can't comment on is from talking to, to DEP, um, when they were looking at water quality trends at their, their water quality networks, um, they began by looking at sites um, that overlapped the Marcellus shale play. And what they were seeing is that they were seeing the same increasing salinization in waterways outside of the Marcellus play as they were um, within the Marcellus play. So regardless of the, you know, where that's at, um, we're seeing similar salinization trends. Um, you know, there could be instances, especially where uh, those products are being spread uh, as a dust suppressant where, you know, you could see um, additional increases in, in the salinization of those waterways. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to have us move on here uh, to our next presenter here. We need to be uh, uh, mindful of our uh, time slot here. Uh, so if we could uh, move on to our second presenter, Sean Hartzell. Sean, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. And uh, I'd just like to say good morning to the commissioners in attendance and also members of the public that are tuning in. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, take the opportunity to talk just briefly about some aquatic invasive species project updates, uh, things that we as the agency are working on uh, very often with partners. Uh, and in some cases, partners are leading the charge and we're collaborating uh, or things that we're kind of uh, carrying the torch with. Uh, so very happy for the opportunity to discuss these items today. Next slide, please. Uh, so first, I just wanted to give an update on an ongoing project, uh, which really kicked off uh, earlier this year. Uh, so we've been doing aquatic invasive species identification trainings for field staff. Uh, this is part of our strategic plan, uh, strategic plan goal 15F, and it's a project that's supported by Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding, uh, which is a federal grant, uh, grant funding that we've received. And so. Uh, over the, the cooler months earlier this year, uh, we hosted seven virtual trainings for WCO staff uh, in the winter and spring of 2021. And then we had two virtual trainings for staff in our Division of Fisheries Management, uh, and these were also in the wintertime in February 2021. Uh, so we had the, the majority, I believe almost all staff uh, from both of these parts of the agency uh, that are full time were able to participate in these trainings. Um, and so these are folks that are in the field uh, very often uh, performing their job duties, 
Uh, we wanted to get them trained to recognize aquatic invasive species. So as they're outperforming their regular duties, they could potentially recognize infestations, uh, notice that there's invasive species and in, in waterways, and then report that so we could do follow up action when needed. Uh, so th this was very successful. Uh, we had feedback from all the folks that uh, took these trainings. Uh, the feedback was largely positive. And uh, we still have funding uh, for this grant, and so we have future trainings that are going to be forthcoming uh, over the next uh, roughly calendar year uh, for other agency staff with that remaining grant funding. Uh, this will include uh, Division of Environmental Services staff, uh, actually just a training that will hold on Friday during a division meeting, um, and then also Division of Habitat Management staff later this winter, uh, possibly other staff within the agency as well. Uh, something that was noted from the feedback, uh, a lot of folks really responded well to the section of the training focused on aquatic plant identification. Uh, and so some future workshops um, next year may focus more strongly. Uh, we may have special workshops focusing on aquatic plant ID to distinguish between native aquatic plants and invasive aquatic plants. Uh, and lastly, uh, these trainings are paying off already. Uh, over the past uh, several months, since we hosted the trainings earlier this year, uh, we've had several new trainings or several new identifications of aquatic invasive species that field staff have found uh, that they've attributed to these trainings. So uh, they're out there in the field, they're recognizing invasive species that they haven't recognized before, uh, and then reporting that uh, within the agency uh, for follow up. So paying off already. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so next, uh, just summarizing some important field projects that are ongoing for aquatic invasive species. Uh, the, these projects go in part to address strategic plan goal 15B, uh, which addresses an up-to-date inventory of aquatic invasive species in the Commonwealth. And so the first project I'd like to briefly highlight is an ongoing New Zealand mud snail survey partnership uh, with Penn State affiliate Nick McKelko. Uh, who has done quite a bit of work on the New Zealand mud snail previously in Pennsylvania. Uh, Nick and myself are tag teaming surveys in a way. I'm uh, doing surveys in waters in the central portion of the state. Uh, and Nick is working on the eastern portion of the state. Uh, this is an ongoing project. We're still uh, doing surveys and plan to continue with this, uh, but it's resulted in multiple detections of the New Zealand mud snail uh, in popular trout waters, both in central and eastern Pennsylvania. The good news is there are also some waters that we have not found the New Zealand mud snail in. So some good news coming from that as well in that ongoing project. Uh, next up is an ongoing round goby population assessment at Lake LaBeouf in Erie County. Uh, and Lake LaBeouf is within the French Creek watershed, one of our most biodiverse uh, areas uh, in Pennsylvania. And so agency staff are collaborating with folks from Indiana University of Pennsylvania on this project. Uh, Tim uh, Schaefer was actually able to get out in the field with us uh, roughly one month ago for this project. Um, and there's a grad student from IUP by the name of Darby Byington, uh, who's actually going to be assessing all of this data all of this data for her master's thesis. Uh, what, what we're evaluating is uh, capture methods for the round goby, so what gear type is best to sample them uh, and remove them from the water. Uh, she is also going to be evaluating their distribution within the lake. She'll be evaluating their population uh, status, so looking at their population structure, size classes, et cetera. And finally, she'll be dissecting all of the round gobies that are collected uh, and looking at their stomach contents to see uh, what they're consuming and what those impacts on native species by consumption may be for that population. Uh, so this is an ongoing project. I, Darby is just starting to look at her data now, uh, but we'll have some really interesting uh, data that we can poten potentially put towards management uh, for that population in that area. So very excited to uh, be working with that. Next up, uh, there's ongoing flathead catfish diet research in the Susquehanna Basin. Uh, this is being led by our Susquehanna River biologist, Jeff Smith, and partners with Penn State. It's also the subject of a Penn State's uh, graduate student's master's thesis. Uh, flathead catfish are native to Western Pennsylvania, but were introduced into the Susquehanna Basin a few decades ago. Um, and so they're doing diet research, seeing what these fish are eating. Uh, in order to evaluate the potential impacts they may have there. So again, an ongoing project, um, I believe they're, they've collected the majority of the fish uh, in their targeted sample and will start evaluating the stomach contents uh, with that project. 
And then finally, uh, we have pursued Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding, a federal grant source uh, for pilot aquatic invasive species surveys of lakes managed by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Uh, so it's a project, uh, if we get the funding, hoping to jump into that next year. Um, I'll be the lead for that, uh, doing surveys, kind of doing a health check of, if you will, uh, at lakes that we manage to uh, see if there's any new introductions of aquatic invasive species there. Next slide, please. So next up is just a quick summary of work on the Pennsylvania AIS Management Plan. Uh, so the Pennsylvania AIS Management Plan was put together in 2006, and then we have uh, funding opportunities annually uh, from a federal source to address the goals laid out in that plan and work towards the completion of that plan. Uh, and this is related to our agency's strategic plan goal 15A. Just some highlights quick of recent projects uh, with Pennsylvania Sea Grant as a major partner, very often Sea Grant are really carrying the torch uh, with these and we are collaborators. But just some highlights include the development of an aquatic invasive species rapid response plan uh, and protocol for the Commonwealth. So kind of a guidance document that outlines when we get a new infestation of a high priority aquatic invasive species, what we do in order to respond to that. Uh, there's also aquatic invasive species outreach and education work, some presentations, signage, et cetera. I'll talk a little bit more about the signage later. Uh, they're also working to develop electronic phone app versions of the Pennsylvania AIS field guide with a reporting tool. So uh, there was an aquatic invasive species field guide that was put together in 2015 by Sea Grant and Partners, a uh, paper guide for folks to use to identify aquatic invasive species. This is migrating to mobile. So it's uh, being turned into a phone app. Uh, there's actually already a uh, Apple version of this app available. And this current project is working towards creating an Android app. So folks can now identify aquatic invasive species on their phone, uh, take a picture, click a few buttons, and that actually gets reported to us at the agency. There's also work uh, just initiating on the development of a round goby control plan for the French Creek watershed. And some of the work that I mentioned previously at Lake LaBeouf on the round gobies will really inform this effort. Last but not least, uh, we have work that's just in the initial stages on the Walnut Creek Marina. Uh, we're looking towards putting or doing a retrofit uh, to include an aquatic invasive species cleaning station. I'll elaborate more on that as well later. Next slide, please. Uh, so we're also continuing work on aquatic invasive species control plans and risk assessments related to strategic plan goal 15B. Uh, the agency previously had control plans for several aquatic invasive species. Uh, these were all produced uh, in 2011, so they were approximately a decade old. Uh, so in, in need of update, uh, given the, the time uh, that had elapsed. Um, and so we've recently completed updates for the European water chestnut, DHS virus, golden algae, and invasive carp control plans. Uh, we're working on an update currently for the Didymo control plan that should be available soon and also working on new control plans for other aquatic invasive species, including rusty crayfish and New Zealand mud snail. A number of other species too on this list here that I've put down and there's others uh, that we'll get to as well in the years to come. So we'll have a number of these prepared uh, as we move forward in the future. Also, we're working on draft impact and risk assessments. Uh, this is basically a system that ranks aquatic invasive species, evaluates their total impact uh, potential for the state of Pennsylvania and helps us prioritize. Uh, right now, we have draft assessments for 13 species that have been completed to date. Uh, this is great progress and we're gonna continue working on more um, as we move forward with this. Uh, the preliminary results from this project uh, suggest, at least with the group assessed so far, we have very high impacts, high risk from zebra mussels, rusty crayfish, and big head carp. Uh, this isn't really that much of a shock. These are well known to be uh, uh, very impactful aquatic invasive species. Next slide, please. So just wanted to highlight some educational efforts that have been ongoing. Uh, our agency has either partnered with or internally uh, run our own uh, uh, social media campaigns for aquatic invasive species. We've had a number of posts that we've put out. Um, and the most recent and something I'm most excited about uh, was a partnership uh, uh, that we collaborated with, uh, which is run by the Great Lakes Commission 
called the Aquatic Invasive Species Landing Blitz. Uh, this was an online event, so social media blitz, if you will, on aquatic invasive species where numerous agencies and partners put out posts all during the same week on aquatic invasive species. Uh, we generated some posts of our own. We also shared posts or adopted posts uh, that others had put together within this group. And just within our agency alone, uh, just with our social media, uh, we generated over 100,000 impressions. So that's people that are actually clicking the like button on social media, clicking the share button for those posts. Uh, so reached well over 100,000 people. Uh, that's fantastic. It really impressed me. Uh, we've also had several news media outlets and periodicals produce articles on aquatic invasive species and agency staff uh, have provided interviews uh, for those. And uh, also working on aquatic invasive species signs, we have a number of them already uh, that we're posting in various waters. An example is the picture of the northern snakehead sign uh, on the screen here, which was produced last year. New signs that we just recently printed hot off the press include signs for Didymo, invasive crayfish species, and around goby. And so these will be posted uh, in appropriate areas in the Commonwealth. And in addition to that, uh, folks on this call today, you're probably familiar or probably seen at boat ramps or fishing accesses the Stop Aquatic Hitchhiker uh, signage uh, that's posted throughout much of the Commonwealth. Uh, Pennsylvania Sea Grant uh, is working uh, uh, in partnership with us. We've had some great discussions and they're working on non-English translations of those signs for Pennsylvania. So in areas where we have English and voters who speak other languages such as Spanish, uh, we'll be posting signs in non-English languages as well to reach out to those communities. Last but not least uh, for the education bit, we've just applied for funding in partnership with Pennsylvania Sea Grant for a bait fish identification guide project. So uh, the product, once this is completed, uh, we'd like to have a, a short guide printed out, kind of a booklet, if you will, that anglers, uh, bait shops, and other groups can use to identify bait fish species in Pennsylvania. And that distinguishes bait fish that are native uh, from invasive bait fish to help prevent the spread of non-native bait fish species. And also just to help folks, uh, you know, get to know the bait fish that they may be using. So I see this as a useful tool, both from the aquatic invasive species perspective, but also just something, a tool that our, our anglers may be very interested in in the state. Next slide, please. So finishing up here, uh, just wanted to talk. I have a few slides on this. Um, one of our strategic plan goals is to work towards putting boat cleaning stations uh, at agency managed access that have known infestations of aquatic invasive species. This is strategic plan goal 15E. And so this is something that uh, in my position, I've done a lot of focus on of late. Um, and I was very interested to find uh, both through looking in the literature and talking to folks um, in other agencies, other states, seeing what other folks are doing. Um, hand cleaning for aquatic invasive species uh, seems to be equally as effective as washing boats, at least in most cases, uh, to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. And so if you're out boating for the day on the lake, uh, you pull your boat up the boat ramp, park it. If you just take the time to thoroughly examine your boat, pick off um, any bits of mud, any aquatic plants, any other critters that are hanging on there, inspect it thoroughly. Uh, that can be, in some cases, equally as effective as taking your boat to a pressure washing station. Uh, and so in light of this, uh, many other folks in the U.S., uh, such as our, our neighbors upstate uh, in New York, um, and also uh, actually right here at home um, in some of the uh, Pennsylvania State Parks managed by DCNR uh, in, in Western uh, Pennsylvania, folks have installed what's called an aquatic invasive species disposal station. Uh, so there's a picture of that on the slide. This is a really simple concept. It basically is just a, a wooden frame, if you will, with signage, uh, telling people, uh, giving them instructions on how to properly clean their boat to inspect their boat for the presence of aquatic invasive species as they are leaving the ramp. And it's usually installed in an area uh, somewhere off to the side on the ramp, out of the way of traffic, so to speak, to give folks an area where they can pull off, do that inspection of their boat, uh, and pick off any, any mud, uh, plant matter, et cetera, uh, to clean their boat. Um, and then uh, you can see there's gravel at the bottom of this station. 
Uh, it's a disposal station. It actually allows invasive species to compost. So bits of plants, hydrilla, uh, what have you, uh, they're able to pick off, actually put in this gravel area and then a compost. So like I said, these are pretty common in New York State. I think New York State has about 100 of these roughly. If you go to New York State, you may be familiar uh, with these as well. And we have a few of these in Pennsylvania that have been installed by DCNR. Uh, we're looking internally uh, to maybe put together a pilot for something like this or a similar concept uh, at launches managed by our agency that have known aquatic invasive species infestation. So very happy to be kind of leading the charge with this project. Next slide, please. So I had mentioned the uh, Walnut Creek access. Um, so kind of looking at a similar concept to this as well, although I'll say because the Walnut Creek Marina is a marina, uh, there's a lot of traffic there. We have slips where boats sit, et cetera. It needs to be something a little bit more robust than the concept that I mentioned previously for more simple uh, boating accesses. Uh, and so we've been partnering with Pennsylvania Sea Grant. Uh, there's a Walnut Creek Access Aquatic Invasive Species Cleaning Station Retrofit. Uh, that's been proposed in partnership with Sea Grant, uh, and we've acquired Aquatic Invasive Species Management Plan grant funding uh, towards the planning stages of this project. So we're just in the initial planning stages, just trying to figure out kind of what the concept would look like. Uh, if you look at the picture on the slide, uh, I apologize if it's a little bit uh, in low resolution, but this is something uh, from Sea Grant. Uh, kind of a concept slide that Sea uh, Grants and other states have, have worked towards. Uh, basically, it illustrates an area where there's pavement, there's a bit of a pull off where folks can get out of the way of traffic, clean their boat. Uh, there'll be a disposal station as well as signage, uh, potentially also a washing station because at marinas, uh, it is a good idea to have that washing for boats that are sitting in slips for a long period of time. So we're just really in the planning stages. We have a few meetings forthcoming to discuss this. And the funding that we've acquired is going to go towards the design uh, of this project. So to put together an engineering design and then subsequently pursue funding uh, for the actual retrofit down the road. So excited to be jumping in on this as well and looking forward to giving updates uh, as this progresses. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, last but not least, uh, we have the Pennsylvania Lake Management Society or Palms, uh, and we actually awarded them a boating facilities grant. Um, and this is going to fund a boat wash education project, which ties into strategic plan goal 15 E. Uh, so what they're pursuing is they're going to acquire a CD3 trailer mounted boat cleaning station. You can see a picture of that on the slide. Um, on, uh, on the uh, slide on the screen right here. Uh, this is a cleaning station for boats that's mounted on a trailer. It doesn't use any water, uh, but there are hand tools. You can see things like squeegees and tongs that folks can use to clean their boats and there's some instructions there. So they'll be carting this to various lakes uh, next year um, and having folks there with the system to do outreach on why uh, folks should clean their boats to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. Next slide, please. All right, so finishing up here, uh, last but not least, I'd just like to note uh, new occurrences of aquatic invasive species. Uh, we've had several, as mentioned, uh, new finds of New Zealand mud snails in southeast and central Pennsylvania. Uh, zebra mussels were detected in Raystown Lake, Huntington County in March of this year, a new infestation. Uh, Northern snakehead were found in Elk Creek in Chester County. Not a huge surprise as Elk Creek uh, flows into Maryland. They were known for the Maryland waters, uh, so snuck up here. Uh, and uh, also Carolina Fanwort at Moon Lake, Luzerne County, and Variable Leaf Milfoil at Goldsboro Lake, Monroe County. Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, we can go to the next slide. I just, uh, if we have time, could jump into questions. Is there any questions for Sean? Yeah, Sean, this is Commissioner Hussar. Uh, um, I'm currently participating, and I have been the last five months on a uh, through Penn State, um, their AIS um, program. I'm doing a diary with them with my mm -hmm. fishing, um, you know, where I record every two weeks where I fished, and they have a list of uh, species, invasive species that I identify whether I've seen them or not. Um, is that is that where we're, we're we're going with the app you're going to try to create where we collect where we could collect this data and sort of get a feel from 
fishermen out there? Is that the intent? Uh, yeah, that's the intent. So that the app is mainly piloted by Sea Grant, uh, but it's available to the public. Uh, we're also encouraging agency staff to use that. Um, it's not a uh, something that folks are necessarily uh, asked to use regularly or, or you know to report uh, everywhere they go, but certainly we encourage that. So just kind of another tool uh, for getting good information on where aquatic invasive species might be uh, from the public that can come to us. And uh, I, I'm not familiar with the Penn State project, but that sounds very interesting. I'll, well, I, and I'll, I'll follow up with you offline when when this concludes. Uh, maybe you could get your hands on their their uh, their program. What they, which I, th I believe we started this in May, and uh, yeah, it's pretty. You know, again, it's pretty thorough. It takes about ten minutes to do, but uh, we'll we'll follow up with that offline. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I do want to highlight, though, uh, uh, Montana's uh, 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 I get their emails from the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. They did show uh, in their efforts, obviously, they have a lot of boating cleaning efforts out there with AIS. Mm -hmm. um, they did show on one of the one of the last uh, uh, emails I got was a boat from Lake Erie with mussels attached to it. So uh, I don't know where on Erie, but uh, again, they showed the picture of the boat with mussels attached to it, and they they commented on it as part of their marketing and messaging efforts uh, with AIS. So uh, sort of it ties into what we're doing here. But mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And Erie is unfortunately uh, very infested with zebra mussels as well as quagga yep. mussels. So uh, something we really want to focus on to prevent the spread from outside of that lake. Thanks, Sean. Uh, can we, uh, we're, I'm watching the time here and we're getting to where we have just about a half hour left. Uh, how about if we move on to our next uh, presenter, Nevin Welt? And if we have some time left at the end here, uh, maybe we can ask some questions of presenters here if there's unanswered questions that commissioners have. Uh, Nevin, let's move on to you then. All right, thank you, Commissioner Anderson, and thank you, uh, commissioners and the public listening today. I, I'm excited to talk to you guys a little bit about some freshwater mussel work that we've been doing. Um, the project today that I wanna discuss is the uh, Mussel Silo Project, in which we're evaluating mussel growth, survival, and rest restoration potential in Western Pennsylvania streams and rivers. And um, I have to point out that it's not just me working on this project. Um, my co-authors, Mary Walsh, Eric Chapman, and Ryan Miller are heavily involved with this project. And um, they'll be helping me present this with the pictures that they provided and the input that they provided. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this project is a WRCP project uh, funded by DCNR. And it involves, uh, project partners and collaborators such as uh, the Fish Commission and the U.S. Forest Service. And it's, as I mentioned earlier, it is being led by Mary Walsh and Eric Chapman. They're the ones that received the grant. Um, next slide, please. So the, the background for this uh, project, uh, the genesis was really from um, a study that was done in Kentucky by Dr. Wendell Haig with the U.S. Forest Service, uh, which he was looking at growth and survival and uh, the implications for understanding muscle declines. Um, when Chris Urban and I were charged with putting together a request for a proposal, uh, we considered, well, maybe the opposite is also true. We can look at uh, streams potential for uh, restoration and recovery uh, for both either the stream or for muscles in the streams. So this grant was awarded to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy in the spring of 2020. However, uh, work did not start in 2020 due to COVID. And so that kind of pushed things back into uh, this year. So um, the project is still ongoing. And um, so today's discussion is more topical and I don't actually have like data to present to you because we have not collected and analyzed all our data yet. Um, the interesting thing was though, uh, this spring we were contacted by Wendell Haig and the Forest Service uh, to partner on a nationwide project looking at causes of muscle decline. So this actually increased our uh, data set and the different variables that we can look at. So I think our project that kind of started small with a smaller budget is actually gonna have a lot more data and be pretty data rich and help us make informed decision. Uh, next slide, please. 
So how is this study contributing to our st strategic goals? Um, basically, um, you know, we have our Union City State Fish Hatchery, which is doing mussel propagation. If we identify streams and species for restoration, um, then I think we're uh, making good use of that facility. And certainly if we're um, doing species restoration, we're committing to our species action plans. So next slide, please. So I, I always try to emphasize to folks, there's a reason that we care for freshwater mussels. And, um, and so why should we care? Um, mussels are the little bivalve mollusks that live in our streams and rivers, and they're our most imperiled aquatic organisms in North America. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's 74% that are of some level of concern in Pennsylvania, including four state listed and nine federally listed. So this is more federally listed animals than any other taxa group uh, in Pennsylvania. And so, besides their uh, imperilment, um, there's actually a very important function that they provide to society, such as being natural water filters. They remove contaminants from the water column, sediments from the water column, and make our water cleaner. Additionally, they also provide uh, high invertebrate abundances on their shells, <clears throat> which support smaller fish and larger fish and support the angling community. So, there's benefits to society. Also, um, mussels serve as food for fish and for wildlife, particularly like uh, fish species like the uh, freshwater drum and for wildlife such as otters, muskrats, and raccoons. And for our agency, they're really the canary in the coal mine. Um, they can tell us whenever things are going wrong in a watershed uh, much sooner than um, say like the fishes or whatever. So next slide, please. So, what has caused some of these historical declines um, to our mussel communities? And the real easy things are things like the steel industry of the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. The picture on the right is actually of the Mahoning River um, just over the Pennsylvania border. Um, also, the dams and dredging that occurred. Uh, the picture in the lower left is a picture of the first lock and dam on the Ohio, this is the Davis Island lock and dam. And then so, also, we had some pretty severe sedimentation issues related to logging at the turn of the century. So a lot of the muscles that we had back then, we do not have now, given these impacts. So we have new threats today, uh, such as the round goby that Sean mentioned, and then things like the Asian clam. Uh, next slide, please. So with all those threats kind of being addressed with the Clean Water Act, and um, with regulations, um, including some fish commission regulations, there's really some optimism for muscle recovery and for stream recovery. Additionally, uh, people seem to be uh, much more aware of the conservation issue and the conservation value of freshwater mussels. So it gives us as an agency and hopefully the public some optimism that we can make a difference towards species and stream restoration. Next slide, please. So this muscle silo project is focused on uh, the Western Pennsylvania uh, streams and rivers. And the reason for that is most of uh, Pennsylvania's diversity is located in the Western part of the state and particularly in the Ohio River Basin. We have 54 species historically, including 11 uh, that are state or federally listed, which is more than over on the Atlantic coast. And a lot of species that have either historically occurred here or no longer occur here. So this kind of presents us some opportunities for uh, species recovery and also for stream recovery. Next slide, please. So how do we test some of these streams uh, for their restoration readiness or for their species uh, restoration readiness? Uh, we ended up building these uh, concrete muscle silos. They weigh about 30 pounds a piece and we basically, basically put them together in these little mixing bowls. Um, within these mixed holes are these uh, PVC units that are covered with a screen on both sides, and that's where we store the uh, juvenile freshwater mussels. You'll notice in the top right hand corner, that's our little PVC insert, and those are some juvenile mussels that are placed into it. So these, mus or these silos, uh, once they're constructed, the mussels are placed into it. Um, the silos are then placed into the river. Next slide, please. So it's kind of been mentioned and inferred earlier. Our goal is to evaluate the muscle growth and survival and to determine the restoration potential. 
And this is really exciting, I think, for me and for others, um, because we actually have the means via the Union City State Fish Hatchery that begin recovering mussel population. These guys, and well, Scott specifically is going to talk about this after me, uh, have been working to uh, propagate freshwater mussels. So this is an awesome tool for us to utilize uh, moving forward. Next slide. So where, where is the study taking place? We have 13 streams and rivers in uh, Western PA that we're looking at, including the best of the best, which are the Allegheny, French Creek, and the Shenanga River between the two reservoirs. Um, the deep faunated streams, streams where we have lost most of our fauna, where we have very few species left, such as the Beaver, the Clarion, Dunker Creek, which was uh, wiped out in 2009. And we have some streams that are where the fauna is somewhere in between. And these include Little Mahoning Creek, Mahoney, Sandy Creek, Ten Mile, and Tyanesta. And so we have one site in each of these streams where we place mussel silos. So the next slide, please. So at each of these sites, like I said, we only have one site per um, river or stream. We place muscle, uh, four mussel silos with approximately 20 juvenile plain pocketbooks. And we chose these juvenile plain pocketbooks because they're pretty ubiquitous throughout the Ohio River Basin. And juvenile mussels in general or tend to be more susceptible to uh, contaminants or water quality issues uh, in any stream or watershed. Uh, we conducted some basic water uh, quality measurements, such as hardness, alkalinity, et cetera, temperature, and then also some sediment quality measurements. And we did Asian clam surveys. So the, our partnership with the U.S. Forest Service actually allowed us to collect much more data, and they brought far more resources uh, to the plate, which is kind of exciting. And so additional parameters that we're measuring include things like sediment deposition, transport, uh, food availability in the water column and in the sediments, core samples. And we're also looking at what kind of pathogens and parasites are in the stream um, that we're sampling. Uh, pathogens and parasites are obviously a big um, issue in terms of uh, muscle culture and, and muscle restoration. So there's not a whole lot known. So this is kind of exciting to have an opportunity to examine Pennsylvania streams and rivers for these uh, pathogens. And then we're also examining the, the health of the muscles themselves, including um, how they do. I mean, not only do they survive, do they grow, but how are they um, functionally uh, existing? Are they doing well or are they just kind of barely hanging on, that type of thing? Next slide, please. So, like I said, I unfortunately on, for today do not have data to present to you. We actually pulled all our silos last week, um, all our data loggers last week, and did our last uh, chemical and water quality test last week. So I don't have that information in front of me to present to you, but maybe I can do it later. But hopefully we can get a ranked list of streams for restoration. And this will definitely benefit uh, what we're trying to accomplish at the Union City State Fish Hatchery uh, via mussel propagation, and also help us to identify potential streams where we can move um, mussels that are opportunistically available from bridge projects or pipeline replacement projects. So, and we'll, another thing too, with the forest service partnership, we're able to hopefully identify some of the limiting factors. So if we have streams where mussels aren't growing, we're surviving very well, maybe we can begin to understand what some of the limiting factors are and try to address some of those for future mussel recovery. And ultimately, um, these mussel silos might become a tool where we can expand uh, our efforts to other streams and rivers, such as the Susquehanna River. Uh, some of that might be con contingent upon funding. So if the Recovering America's Wildlife Act comes to fruition, maybe there'll be future funds available to help uh, us expand our efforts. So with that, next slide, please. I think we're gonna hold off on questions until after Scott's presentation. So um, to give Scott some time to do his presentation. So. Maybe if you stew on this for a little bit, we can talk about it after Scott's. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Nevin. You must have been reading my mind there. That was what I was thinking too there that uh, we should move forward with uh, Scott's presentation. Uh, hopefully we'll have a few minutes here at the end for any questions. Uh, Scott, Ray, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, you can go ahead, sir. So, I am uh, the foreman at the Union City Fish Hatchery. Um, you can see the photo on the left is the 
Um, the newest photo of what we have, I'm going to kind of go over everything that we've done over the past two years uh, to get the facility up and running. Um, on the right hand side, you're going to see a picture of some round hickory nut mussels, which we're currently growing out. And I'll explain where those uh, come from uh, shortly. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, as Nevin kind of touched on, why do we care about the restoration effort of mussels? Um, we want to replace anything that's been killed, specifically in Dunker Creek. Uh, but then, in addition to anything that else has caused problems where they've been around the state and they haven't uh, been there, they've been depopulated, or maybe they're just hanging on, but they don't have any um, good reproduction. Um, so, Mussels are the, the base of all pretty much all aquatic life. Um, they, they pull all those nutrients out of the water, they provide food for the macroinvertebrates, and then those provide food for the fish, and then the cascade effect all the way up to our game fish that, that all the anglers care for. Um, in addition, they stabilize all our stream and river banks. Um, and like Nevin mentioned, we also talk about the canary in the coal mine. So if there's any kind of issues, uh, mussels are one of the first uh, animals that are affected by that. Uh, and the big thing that helps us is that they do cleaner water also. Um, next slide, please. Talking about cleaning the water, uh, this is actually a picture from one of our quarantine tanks. The photo on the left is shortly after we fed them algae, uh, one of our stock algae solutions. The photo on the right is about 16 hours afterwards. Uh, you can see how clean that water is. It's pretty much crystal clear, and there's only about two to 300 mussels that are about a centimeter in size. So you can scale that up to a larger population into a river, and you can really see how much of a difference they can make just in that short amount of time, uh, keeping our water clean and, and helping us um, get our rivers and, and lakes clean. Next slide, please. So for those of you that don't know how a muscle uh, reproduction happens, uh, I'll do a quick review here. So there are males and females. The uh, Females hold brood inside their gills, uh, modified uh, marsupial. They're able to trick the host, which is typically a fish or a salamander. Um, those glochidia, which are the baby mussels, get attached to the fish's fins, mostly on their gills, though. Um, and then they live anywhere from two to four months, or two to four weeks, I mean. Um, then they're going to be on there. They're going to be a parasite for that two to four weeks. And then they're going to fall off and then they're going to start their life cycle where they start filter feeding at that point. Um, and then they're going to eventually repeat the entire process. Next slide, please. So how this got started, um, Nevin mentioned a little bit about Dunker Creek. Um, in 2009, there was a mine spill and there was approximately 30 miles of stream that was killed. Um, pretty much everything was killed during that time. They estimated there's about 50,000 fish species, fish of about 40 species. And then there's about 14,000 mussels estimated. Um, and they're, they're figuring about 14 species. Um, after this, there was a settlement that occurred in 2013. And that in 2014, shortly after that settlement, is the Fish and Boat Commission talked about possibly starting a propagation facility, but they were unsure about where and how we could get it started. Um, in 2019 and late 2018 and early 2019, um, they had talked more about it and through this funding uh, from the Dunker Creek Settlement, in addition to state wildlife grants and some uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, we're able to get things started. Um, in addition to that, um, the RAWA Act, Re Recovering America's Wildlife Act, if that does get approved, uh, that could be a huge um, jolt of money for us to get things going and really help us out. Um, I know I never mentioned that also, but it could really get a lot of um, money for special species of anything that's non-game related or of the greatest concern uh, within our state. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in late 2018, um, we decided we were going to uh, start the um, muscle propagation facility here at Union City. Um, so through 2019, we decided we had to revamp everything at the facility. The photo on the upper right, you can see that is our hatch house building that was full of tanks, which was used to rear warm, cool water fishes, uh, such as musky, northern pike. Um, we completely tore the hatch house down, um, got a new floor put in, and uh, we got that all revamped and, and uh, cleaned up. We addition are building all the systems that I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, we started building those in 2019 and then in early 2020. 
Um, in late 2019, we were able to get our first mussels in through um, a partnership with the Fish and Wildlife Service at the White Sulphur Springs Hatchery. They had to depopulate their hatchery and the mussels that were being grown out for us currently through a DEP grant to work with uh, restoring mussels in Dunker Creek. So they sent us uh, about 2,500 mussels and we were able to test our systems and make sure that we were able to keep the animals alive like we were required to and um, learn how we developed all those systems. So in late or in, in early 2020, we were able to do our first infestation on our own, which was with a plain pocketbook mussel. Um, you can see them down on the lower left. And we we're able to do that and test all our systems from the infestation equipment and all the way through uh, to see if we need to do any improvements. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Some of the equipment that we had to purchase um, was quite expensive, um, but it is a necessary um, part to make sure that we have success in the muscle propagation facility. On the left hand side, you can see that large box that is a uh, medical grade cell counter. And on the left is a um, microscope, a stereo microscope with a camera that's mounted in it. Um, those are vital parts to this muscle propagation and it was recommended that we have these items by the people that have been doing this uh, for you know, 20, 30 years and uh, people that have written books about propagation. They said it'll make your life a lot easier and it's a, a lot better uh, result when you have these particular items. Next slide. This is a readout from our cell counter. So you can see on the left hand side is the number of cells. So that is the cells per milliliter of algae in this case that we're looking for. We're looking for certain amounts of algae and this machine can tell us exactly the amount of algae per milliliter and the size. This can read this out in within about three minutes. It would take somebody probably an hour to do this on a hemicytometer. So this machine can read us 15, 20 readings in about an hour where it would take one person an entire day to do the same amount. So it is a lifesaver and it does make our lives a lot easier. And we also have concrete numbers uh, that is put out by the computer instead of having uh, human error that could possibly uh, mess things up a little bit. Next slide, please. In addition to that, we have a really nice stereo microscope with a camera. Um, we got some really cool pictures on the top left. You can see exactly how small the items are that we're using. This is a standard piece of salt, standard table salt, and that tiny little shell on the right hand side of that is one of the baby glochidia that is just out of the um, female. So it's about a third of the size of salt. So just remember that uh, next time you're thinking you put some salt on food that the animals that we're working with are less than half the size of that. Um, on the lower left, you can see some other neat pictures. Those are plain pocketbook mussels that are growing out. They're about 500 microns. So they're about half the size of that piece of table salt. And then there's also a 3D image up on the right hand corner. And then the lower right hand corner is a kidney shell conglutinate, which those little conglutinates hold all the baby mussels. Those are used to trick the fish to eat them where they explode and then they get infested on the fish's gills. Um, so that's one of the methods that is used for reproduction uh, to trick the fish into getting the mussels onto their gills. Next slide, please. So some of the equipment that we had to build. Um, the one photo on the left is what we call an Ahab drop system. The infested fish um, get put in there and they're in there for anywhere from two to four weeks. As the mussels continue to develop, they will eventually get to the point where they'll drop off. As they drop off, they get collected into the little PVC cups there. Uh, those cups have 150 micron mesh, and then they get collected there, and then we pull them out every single day, and then we look at them, get an idea how many we have, and then they'll go into the next stage. Uh, the photo on the right-hand side is another system that we use for a little bit larger fish or different, different types of fish, and that system we call the round drop system. <clears throat> and then on the far right of that picture, there's a micron filter because these mussels are very sensitive um, and they're so small they get predated on by numerous types of animals uh, from flatworms to daphnia, other types of zooplankton. We have to filter this water down to five microns as well as UV sterilize it. Um, instead of using city water um, with all the chemicals that are put in it, we use raw water and then filter it down. 
Uh, you can see on the bottom right hand corner, I have a 5,800 versus 20,000. Uh, that Ahab system, if we would buy it new from a company, would be about $20,000. We were able to build that same system for about $5,800. You can see all three of those systems, uh, plus one more that's right behind the Ahab. Uh, so we have three drop systems plus the micron filtered system we're able to build for just under $20,000. Uh, that gives credit to the employees that I have here at the hatchery that have the willingness and the ability to do that. Um, that saved us greatly and allowed us to really um, work with the budget that we, were, we received um, to get things up and running and really make it worthwhile. Um, but that's a huge cost savings for us um, in the long run. Uh, next slide, please. So after the mussels fall off the host fish, and they're put into the, um, they're collected and enumerated. They get put into these small buckets. These small buckets have little PVC cups, and they sandwich between the muscles are sandwiched between the two cups. And this is what they call a downwelling effect. We have a small pump that pumps water and just circulates the water through there, and it flows down through the small cups, and then that circulates and that gets filtered water, like you saw in the previous picture, and then we dose the buckets with a algae solution based on the cell counts that we get from the cell counter. Once they hit about a millimeter in size, so that's your standard table salt size, uh, they get over to an upweller system and we do the same here. This is a larger system, larger body, body of water, and then we dose that system automatically, just the same as the bucket buckets. And those ones are in there for about um, three to four months after that until they get about two millimeters. Next slide, please. Once they reach two millimeters, uh, you can really start to see their development and actually look like a mussel instead of a small speck of sand. Um, on the right hand side, as many as you've seen, the heath trays, which are used in the trout industry uh, for many, many decades, um, we actually are able to put mussels inside the heath trays and uh, pump pond water over them. Once they get to this size, the, the predation is, is minimal at two millimeters. Uh, we also have pond baskets. Some species like to be put into a pond and then they have sediment on the bottom of that and they, we float them out into our ponds. The reason we float them into our ponds is because ponds tend to grow really good concentrations of algae and it allows us to get better growth because they will be turned onto raw water. Uh, raw water uh, is anything that's not filtered out very much um, and it really produces a better growth than the cultured systems where we use cultured algae. Uh, the top two photos there, you can see the actual size of them and on the right is one of our rearing pans uh, and you can see mussels actually do move around. Uh, they, they've kind of, once they get si situated, they do tend to move a little bit, but they will filter out. Um, and the bottom is the uh, retrofitted that we used. It was an old egg battery at the hatchery that we used to put our tiger muskie, northern pike, and purebred muskie eggs on. Uh, we retrofitted that and put pans underneath there. And those are used to grow out mussels and also used to overwinter mussels um, with the existing equipment that we already had. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> some of our goals that we have for the uh, next year or two um, in the foreseeable future, we need to fine tune all our systems and the procedures. You know, this is really only the first about year that we've been doing this um, on our own. So we have to go through and redo a lot of procedures. We're constantly updating those um, as well as our systems. We constantly rebuild the systems due to um, things that happen and um, the ability of our staff to do that. Um, the main purpose is we're going to be producing the mussels for Dunker Creek. We're going to try to repopulate what was killed off during the 2009 spill, um, as well as any other populations um, in the foreseeable future um, based on some of the data that uh, Nevin and his colleagues are going to assess with the uh, silo project. In the long term, we're going to work into some threatened and endangered species. Uh, Pennsylvania has a number of endangered species, and we have relatively stable populations where other states actually come here to get our um, broodstock, the, the adults, and they are sent there and they're propagating them at their facilities. Um, we have a good relationship with White Sulphur Springs and uh, the Fish and Wildlife there, and they are actually able to send us the original mussels, and also about a, two months ago, they sent us additional mussels that are uh, state listed for us, the pistol grip mussel, and we're continuing to grow them out. Um, we're planning on being able to supply them with some brood stock, and in return, um, they're going to be able to supply us with some uh, transformed mussels at uh, about 
500 microns. Um, part of the, this, the Pennsylvania uh, Fish and Boat Commission strategic plan is to continue to produce mussels um, and repopulate any areas that are in need um, based on um, the, a lot of the work that Nevin and his colleagues are going to be doing. Um, so that's uh, strategic plan number 12. Next slide, please. I'll leave you with a picture. Um, we were lucky enough to have um, executive director and some commissioners up in May of this year, and uh, they were able to see the entire process from the um, extraction of the glochidia, the infestation, um, all the way through to see some of the juvenile mussels at two to three millimeters, as well as some of the mussels um, that we are growing out into the ponds. Um, it was really exciting to have everybody up here. Um, in addition to that, there is an open invitation for uh, many of the commissioners that want to come up and see it. I uh, hear that there's going to be a uh, chance for you to come up and do some steelhead collection in Fairview. Uh, we're only about a half an hour away. So uh, hopefully in November, if you guys can get a chance, you can come down here and uh, we can show you everything else that we've been doing at the hatchery. Um, with that, uh, any questions? Any questions uh, for Scott? Okay, hearing none there. Scott, I want to thank you for the, the fine work that uh, you and your staff do there at Union City. I've been up there twice uh, to visit. Uh, I, I'm just impressed with uh, you and your staff's dedication to this project. Uh, I know you're really in it 110%. Uh, you're really into what you do, and I appreciate that, and I think all the other commissioners do too. Uh, my fellow commissioners, I just suggest that uh, you take some time and go up there and visit Union City. It's uh, uh, time well spent, and uh, I'm glad that uh, I did that, and I have a much better understanding of our, uh, our uh, project up there since I've spent some time with Scott and his staff. Are there any other questions here that we can quickly ask of any of our presenters here that uh, that commissioners would would like to bring up? This is Commissioner Small. I just like to commend the staff for all these fine reports. It's great to see that we're staying on top of the threat of invasives, and uh, and working with mussels to promote clean water. And I also appreciate how our actions and goals are linked to that strategic plan. It, we're, we're really making it work. We're accountable to that. Uh, so I, I appreciate and congratulate the staff for staying focused and all your fine work. Yes, I, I agree. Thanks for all the fine work that all of you uh, do for the agency. Uh, if there's no, is there any other uh, business that we need to bring up here before the Habitat and Environmental Committee uh, uh, today? No, there's not, Don. This is Tim. It's not not a commissioner, and this is not a question, but I just also wanted to, to thank the staff. It really is exciting uh, to see what's going on in the field. And I, I just also want to thank everybody for the integration that's happening uh, across bureaus with other outside agency partners. It really, really is a team effort. So just, just hats off to everybody for the phenomenal work um, that's going on. You know, you heard four great presentations today, and we could have had, you know, 40 more other ones. Um, so, with this system of having our Habitat and Environmental Committee meetings, you know, off cycle, uh, we look forward to sharing more, you know, more exciting information with you guys going forward. And I echo uh, Don's invitation uh, and Scott's also to get out in the field, uh, see what we do. Not only, not only these projects, but anything. If if you'd like to get out with uh, Nevin and Jordy to see the, the muscle work, you know, in the field will strap you into a wetsuit next summer so open invitation to see everything that we're doing okay thank you tim uh wayne melnick would you tell us about the time and place for our october commission meeting chairman anderson our next uh, quarterly commission meeting is scheduled for october 25th and 26th this year, uh, the intention is to hold that as a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, given the uh, COVID situation that could always change. So please, uh, audience, keep an eye on our social media for any updates on that uh, plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Wayne. Uh, I have uh, no uh, other closing remarks. Uh, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Small, I'd so move. 
Okay, do I have a second? Commissioner Hussar, I'll second it. Okay, all those in favor of adjournment? Say aye. 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 Okay, thank you uh, uh, everyone today for your participation. I hope you enjoyed our committee meeting. Thank you.